In 1997, Ian Stewart published his book called Nature's Numbers. And in that book, we got a glimpse of how a mathematician views our natural world. But one chapter really caught my eye. Throughout human history, two views have been formed about how we view nature. One view believes the universe obeys fixed, immutable laws and everything is in a well-defined objective reality. While the other believes that there is no such thing as objective reality, that all is flux and all is change. The rise of science has largely been governed by the first viewpoint, but as we advance together as a society, there have been increasing signs that prevailing cultural background is starting to switch to the second way of thinking. In a span of seven minutes, we're going to talk about the constants of this reality and how they generate, change, and alter the findings of the past. I am Ella Nicole Saragossa, and today we are going to dive deep into the constants of change. And joining me today are Aisley Fate Sabusa, Irene Laban, and Michael Raymond Zamora. Now we begin as we take a step back into the Renaissance with the discoveries of Sir Isaac Newton. When we hear the word Newton, what is the first thing that comes into mind? Is it gravity? The apple falling from a tree? Both guesses are correct. However, did you know that together with Leibniz, Newton invented calculus. With their discovery, they provided the techniques of integration and differentiation. Both techniques work side by side, wherein one undoes the other. Between them, they tell you that if you know any of the functions, position, velocity, or acceleration, at every instant, then you can work out the other two. Due to Newton's law of physics, the change in nature can be described using mathematical processes. For example, wave equation. Wave equation describes the rate of change of the height of the wave. A rate of change is about the difference between some quantity now and its value an instant into the future. Equations of this kind are called differential equations. And with that, we get a call back to calculus. Other examples where differential equations are applied in real life include explaining the exponential growth and decomposition, the modification of return on investment over time, and the modeling of cancer growth or the spread of a disease. To learn more about Newton's discoveries, let us take a trip to outer space. Isn't it fascinating how the Earth is just floating magically in the darkness of space? Who am I kidding? It's not magic. It's the sun's gravity that keeps us in place. A discovery made over 300 years ago, before we even set foot on the moon. Newton's discovery of love gravitation rested upon the solution of describing the universe in terms of differential equations and then solving it. He assumed that the same attractive force must exist between any two bodies in the universe. In those days, solved meant finding a mathematical formula for their motion. Other examples that rested upon a solution of this kind are Ohm's law, laws of friction, and Rule's law. When Newton and his successors tried solving the equations for a system of three or more bodies, they failed to find exact solutions. Instead, they tried to find ways to calculate approximate numbers. For example, around 1860, Charles Eugene de Lunay filled an entire book with a single approximation to the motion of the moon. Other problems that have approximate algorithms are the bin packing problem, the vertex cover, and the shortest super spin. Perhaps you might think we have hit a dead end now, but as it was said before, 
times are changing, and so are the ways we think. In 1994, Ji Hong Sha proved that a system of three bodies is not integrable since it demonstrates Arnold diffusion, which was discovered by Vladimir Arnold. This phenomena produces an extremely slow, random drift in the relative orbital positions. However, this drift is not truly random. This behavior is now known as chaos. Other examples of chaotic behavior include the Lord's Attractor, Double Pendulum, and the Bunimovic Stadium. It is worth noting that this again changes the meaning of solve. It has transitioned from finding a formula to finding approximate numbers, and now it has become telling how the solutions look like. It is wrong to see this development as a retreat, for what this change of meaning has taught us is that for questions like the three-body problem, for instance, no formulas can exist, but there is always a way to solve it. Ian Stewart's book, Nature's Numbers, is filled with useful information as well as new perspectives of the use of mathematics in nature. Stewart expounded the concepts of constants of change, their differential equations, and its relation to change. Furthermore, he advanced it by illustrating how the meaning of solve changed over time with the introduction of new constants through the passing of years. Ian Stewart provides an understanding of nature that does not only rely on mathematical processes, but an understanding of nature's patterns using its own terms by qualitative descriptions. And with that, we can truly say that constants generate change.